Let me get this pulled up real quick. So we're going to be finding 1 John chapter 1 again from where we were last week. So I'm continuing where we were last week. This is what the Lord had put on my heart. So this will be part two. If you didn't hear part one, then I'm sorry. You can have to go back and listen to part one, all right? But, uh, and this is going to have many parts to it. So where I'm beginning from this morning is where I was at last week. And what I'm talking to you about is cultivating fellowship with the Father. Cultivating fellowship with the Father. Now, this is something that, that I am on a personal pursuit of. Uh, and this is not something that is of a recent pursuit, uh, but it has become more intensified in the, uh, the days at hand. I am on an active pursuit. The Bible says that we are to seek him while he may be found. The Bible tells us over and over that we are to seek God. And this is a personal pursuit that I am on, and I thank God for him giving me the time, the space, and the ability to not only share with you what he is sharing with me, uh, but also to be in this fellowship with you. Amen. So I've been starting from this, and I'm talking to you about seven different fields uh, to grow in fellowship with God. And last week, I began to cover a fellowship of faith with you all and the fellowship of light. So this week I'm moving on from that, and I just hope that uh, that, that word has begun to found or find place in your heart. So I want to look at 1 John chapter 1 and begin reading from verse 3 here this morning. Don't you love the word of God? Amen. I love the Bible. You know, this is a, I've become a student of this word, and I have been in this word for almost 25 years, uh, and I, I cannot get enough of this. I am more hungry now than I have ever been. And, I, man, I mean, I was up at 3.30 this morning. I just want to, I, I love God's Word. I mean, it's getting to where I don't even want to go to sleep. I want to be in the Word of God. I know we have to sleep and rest, but, glory to God, I love God's Word. First John chapter 1, verse 3, let's look at it. He says, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you may also have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is who with the father and with his son jesus christ our fellowship is with the father and with his son jesus christ he says in these things write we unto you that your joy may be full this then is the message that we have heard of him and declare unto you that god is light and in him is no darkness at all. God is light. He's not these lights in this building. He is light. In him is no darkness at all. Verse 6, it says, if we say that we have fellowship with him, pay attention to verse 6, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But... If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Amen. Heavenly Father, I turn my heart to you. God, I sense right now in the spirit there is such a great need in this hour. God, not only a need to hear. But Lord, I'm reminded of what Paul said, that the word of God did not come in word only, but it came in power. Amen. It came in the Holy Ghost, and it came with much assurance. I pray this morning, Lord, as the preaching of the word is going forward, I'm reminded, Lord, that even when Peter was at Cornelius' house, and as he preached the word of God, that the Spirit fell on them that heard him. I make a prayer to you, holy God, that even the Spirit of God 
Holy Spirit, I submit myself to you. I put aside, God, every, every intention, every thought of my own heart, and I put aside at this very hour, Lord, to be a vessel, Lord, that is willing and God can be used in this hour. Now I pray, Holy Father, that you give unto me utterance, God, that the gospel may not be hidden, but God, that it may be known. I thank you for the power of even the revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Lord, being made known unto their hearts. Lord, not by the wisdom of men or even words that can be enticing. But God, I thank you that even through the foolishness of preaching that you have chose to save us. I thank you this morning. Holy Father, cause the word that goes forth, Lord, to be in power this morning. The power to heal, the power to change, the power to resurrect, the power to transform, the power to renew, the power to restore. God, I thank you for reviving power. Lord, even coming into the midst of this place. Now, Father, I draw from you. I draw from you, Holy Spirit. And I thank you, Holy Spirit. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Now, I'm just going to take a moment here to recap where I was at last week because I am talking to you about fellowship with the Father. Now, listen to me. This is something for me that before I was a born-again believer, if somebody could have told me that I could have walked and talked with God, I don't know if I would have believed them, but I would have been glad and happy to hear of such because for the most part of what was presented to me in Christianity it really did not have the connotation of a relationship with God. It was more that I had to obey certain rules and regulations. And I'm not saying that there are not things that we have to, uh, do not have to obey. There are things in the word of God that we have to obey. But for the most part, many Christian people were fixated upon how I looked and how I acted and what, what in the world was going on with me. I mean, I was a hardcore sinner. I mean, I'm, I got long hair down to my waist. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in a heavy metal band. I look like, you know, something that just came out of hell. Okay, and, and I smelled of it, and, and everything about my life was of such. And I'm sure that, that uh, the aroma of sin upon me was offensive uh, to, to, the, to the Christian and to the believer. But unto Christ, you know, we, my smell is not what was concerned. It was my heart. And when someone began to talk to me about whether I knew Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, my answer was a most positively no. Now, I'm not, I wasn't out to fool anybody. So, uh, so on and so forth. I have been called out of darkness and I have been called into this fellowship and this relationship with God. And this is a relationship. It is not a religion for me. This is not just a set of, of uh, doctrines and, and beliefs. This is a person. I am... I am called unto a person and I have been called unto a relationship with the God of all gods and the, the king of all kings and the creator of the universe. And I used to look and I thought that Christian people live one of the most boring lives imaginable. I thought they don't party, they don't cuss, they don't drink, they don't smoke, they don't do this, they don't do that. But I did not know that they were walking and talking with God. And if somebody would have just told me that you can walk and talk with God, I would have probably been interested. Listen, there are people out here today who have not heard the truth of the gospel. And the truth of the gospel, it is that Jesus Christ died for you, but he didn't just die for you. And he didn't just die so that you won't go to hell forever. He died for you so that you could live with him forever in his eternal kingdom. And that's, that's the the greater part of this is that I'm not, listen I'm not just concerned about dying and going to heaven I'm, my concern now is that I am when, when I leave this earth I'm going to be in the presence of my God that's the greater part I'm not concerned about the streets of gold or the mansion that he's going to build for me in heaven I'm more concerned about him I just want to see Jesus I just want to look at his face I want to look at his nail scarred hands and I want to look at his feet and I want to see what my God has done for me my God did something for me that no man would do for me.
came and laid down his life for me. And that, that thrills me because, you know, the Bible says that for a righteous man that some may die. But how about for an unrighteous man, an enemy? My God died for me while I was yet an enemy. While I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. And that thrills my heart. Because we had nothing in common. But he was willing to go not only the extra mile, but he was willing to go to the furthest extent for my salvation. And here we are, yet tender before him, even as a tender branch growing before our God. He is the vine and we are the branches. I believe as a believer that I have been called into a relationship and I have also been called into a place where I am to develop and to cultivate this relationship. A relationship is a two-way relationship. Any relationship requires from both parties. You can't have a one-way relationship. They don't work. So I must develop my end of this relationship. Now, I have found that through the course of Christianity, I'm not a novice to this or new, but I have found that without fellowship with God, I didn't say that you were not born again, but listen to me, dear believers. If you have been born again, I believe that it is possible to be born again, but yet not be in fellowship with God. Now you may say, well, what does that mean, Todd? Well, I've found this place many times where you just get into a place where you are carrying out routines, you are carrying out rituals, and you're just going to ceremonies. Listen to me. Going to church won't save you. Having a form of godliness won't save you. This is about a relationship. This isn't about having all of my uh, I's dotted and my T's crossed. This is about a relationship with him. You can have all of the doctrinal beliefs that you need to have, but not be in fellowship with God. I didn't say you weren't going to heaven. I'm talking about fellowshipping with him daily. I'm talking about walking and talking with him on a daily basis. You know, I've, I've, walked, I've walked up, I've talked to thousands and thousands of people about Jesus. And I've walked up to people uh, on the street corners thousands of times and asked them if they know Jesus. And the most common response that I've gotten is I go to church. You know, I didn't ask you about your church I didn't ask you about your denomination. I didn't ask you what street corner it was on. I asked you about Jesus. Do you know Jesus? The greater part of that is that does he know you? You know, Jesus said there was going to be many in that day that say unto me, Lord, Lord. And he says, I'm going to say unto them, depart from me, worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Wow. There is the possibility, and Jesus tells us this even as he speaks to the churches in Revelation, that it is possible as a believer to come into a place where we are lukewarm, even have dead faith, or have lost our first love. So please hear what I'm saying to you, because I believe that if we do not cultivate our end of the relationship, these can be places that we wind up in, where we're just in dead faith. Now I'm moving forward here, because I'm just recapping. Last week I was talking to you about this very statement. The very life of Christianity is fellowship. Not just with one another, but with the Father and with His Son. Look back with me at 1 John chapter 1. Paul, excuse me, John says that truly our fellowship, truly, 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 truly my fellowship is with the Father and with His Son. He says, I'm telling you this and I'm declaring this unto you so that we can have fellowship one with another because he knows who his fellowship is with. It's with the Father God and with his Son. This is the entire life of Christianity is fellowship with God. You know, he came that I might have life and life more abundantly. And I believe, you know, that ain't just me having stuff and a, a Cadillac and a big house. The abundance of life is my fellowship with him because he is my life. This is where my life comes from. Glory to God. So fellowship is a, equal to communion. Now, most of the time we talk about communion as the bread and wine, but in all essence of uh, what the, the word from the, the Bible here says and communicates to us, this is the Greek word that appears and it's called, it's koinonia, and it is one and the same. So if you read this in another way, it would say that we may have communion or you may have communion with us because 
union is with the Father and with his Son. Now, I have explained to you why the reason that we've talked about this is because that communion is where we derive the word communication. So John is telling us that we can have a spiritual communication one with another. I'm talking about a spiritual communication one with another because we are having a communication with the Father and with His Son. And this begins to not only stem into communication, but this begins to stem into a community. And we are a community of believers who have a common union one with another because we are in communication with God. Lord have mercy. We're not just associated. We are sharers together in this. And the Bible also, uh, there's another word used here, which means that we are a partaker. And the Bible talks about us being a partaker of his divine nature and a partaker of his holiness. And we have become partakers of Christ. And this is also another word for fellowship, is that we are partaking or sharing together. We are sharing this together. We have not just a commonality. We don't have just something in common. We are sharing the same person together. Listen. This is a no private interpretation and whatever God will tell me, he will tell you. And whatever he will do for me, he will do for you. He is the same person to me that he is to you. That's why everything must line up with the word of God. If somebody comes into you and they're telling you something that's contrary to the word of God, then John goes on and tells you, this is the spirit of error. This isn't the spirit of truth. This isn't proceeding out from the Father. Well, I'm moving on now into part two. And this part is a part of fellowship with his son and fellowship with the fellow heirs. Now, my first point here in this is that fellowship with the father. If I'm going to have fellowship with the father, then this includes fellowship with the son of God. Listen, fellowship with the father includes the son of God as Lord. Fellowship with the father includes the son of God as Lord. Includes. Why must I say this? Because there are those in this day that would go forth to deceive you. And they will tell you that you can bypass. You can go straight to the Father. You can go straight to Jehovah. Y'all better hear what I'm telling you. They call. They come knocking at your door quite often. I'm not afraid of them knocking at my door. They always leave my house scratching their head and wondering what in the world was he talking about. I'm not, con I'm not concerned about the Jehovah Witnesses. I've been trying to win them to the Lord. I was, I've, I've made declaration even in the spirit. God, give me some Jehovah Witnesses. If we had some Christians that had enough boldness to go and knock on doors as they do, and, and I know all their intentions is not for the right intention because they're trying to earn their salvation, but nonetheless, if we could, had people who were so zealous of faith that they would go and knock on somebody's door, and I, I've knocked on a many a door. Hey, do you know Jesus? You know, I've had the door slammed in my face. People tell me, get out of here. Don't ever come back. I'm not concerned about that. Now, I cannot bypass the Son of God and have fellowship with the Father. I cannot bypass the Son of God and have fellowship with the Father. This is important, and I'm going to show you why in just a few minutes. The Bible of what I'm going to declare to you as well today, these are just a couple of points, is that I must find fellowship, I must, I must find fellowship with the fellow heirs of the gospel, or we'll call it the church, okay? I must find fellowship with believers as well as with the Father. And that's what I just read to you from 1 John. So we're going to move forward right here. I want to begin talking to you about the Son of God. I love to talk about the Son of God. I love to talk about Jesus. People probably get tired of me, me talking about Jesus, but oh well, I'm going to keep on talking to you. I don't have anything else to talk about. This is the word of life. This is all I have. I don't have anything else. You know, Jesus said, will you leave also? And the, Peter said, I don't have anywhere else to go. You have the word of life. That's, that's uh, my heart identifies with that. I don't have anywhere else to go. I don't have a plan B. I don't have a backup plan in this. This is, I have put it all. I have, I'm all in. I'm all in here. I don't have anywhere else to go, Kyle. This is all I have. Well, I'm glad y'all like hearing me. The world is sure enough, they get tired of hearing this. Oh, well, I'm going to keep on preaching it until the last breath. Jesus is the mediator between God and man. The Bible declares to us in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5, it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. There is no other mediator between God and man. Listen to me. I made some notes to myself 
that we do not fellowship with God through a series of cardinals, popes, bishops, saints, or even angels. We do not fellowship with God uh, through a church hierarchy or even through the ministry or a priesthood. And we sure don't fellowship with God through Mary. Now, I ain't trying to knock on the Catholics or any such thing, but the Bible is plain to me that there is one mediator between God and man. And people get confused and misled along the way. And you have people that are praying to saints and praying to angels, and they look into all kind of things, and they're looking for answers from everywhere. The Bible is very specific to me that I don't have to look but one place, the way, the truth, and the life. I look unto Jesus. He is who I look to. If I want to know what's in the heart of God, I look unto Jesus. Glory to God. He is the mediator. He is the mediator. There's only one. There's not two. You know, I've talked on the streets to those who had Baha'i faith. I don't know if you ever heard of them. But anyway, they believe there's nine messiahs. You start talking to them about Jesus, and they'll be agreeing with you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's one of the... Y'all better know there's all kind of whack people that be out here smoking dope and telling you, trying to talk to you about Jesus. Listen, you better know what's light, and you better know what's darkness. And there'll be people out here that'll be trying to tell you there's all kind of different messiahs, and, and he just wanted a messiah. Listen, the whole New Age movement is Arab. And I ain't going to say no more. I'm moving on because I want to talk about Jesus. Now, Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant between God and man. But he is also the intercessor. He is your intercessor. He is your intercessor. And that don't mean that Jesus was just praying for you. That means that God has made a way. He is the bridge. He is the way that he is the only way that you can cross over. He is the only way that you can have any fellowship with the Father. It is through Jesus. That means that he is not just a mediator. A mediator means that there's been some type of negotiation. And he has made the supreme negotiation. And he bought and paid for you as the mediator. But now he also stands before God. He stands before him night and day and day and night. He stands before him forever as your intercessor. The Bible tells us in Romans. 8 and 34. Listen, who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died. Yes, rather is risen again. Christ's death, listen, Christ's death on the cross, and I'm not trying to diminish that in any way, but if you read the book of Romans in chapter 1, it tells us that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power when he was raised from the dead. As glorious as the cross is, as the glorious of the taking away of my sins, the greater part of, of what Christ did is when God raised him from the dead and brought me into newness of life. Thank God he dealt with my old life and my sins and my sinful nature, but God has raised me unto new life. And and this is the life that we have. And it was manifested. And it was in His Son. And He says that this is the fellowship that we now have one with another. Because God is light. And we know that Jesus, that in Him was the light. He is the light. And that light is the life of men. His light is my life. Y'all hearing me this morning. Glory to God. He is risen again. And He is ever, listen, who is even at the right hand of God. It's so good to know that I have somebody who is standing there who is perfect and entire and who was lacking nothing before God. And he is making intercession for me. He is my advocate. The Bible tells me in, in 1 John 2, John goes on to tell us, he says, my little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. He says, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ Christ. The righteous. Now we know that believers stumble along the way. We don't need to be condemned. The Bible tells us that if we are walking according to the flesh, there will be condemnation. But if we walk according to the Spirit, there will not be a condemnation. There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Isn't that what your Bible tells you? Amen. So we know that we have an advocate with the Father. Now I want to move forward. I've made three points there on the Son of God. He is my mediator, my intercessor, and my advocate. I cling to those things. I hold to those things. And I know that this is my only way to God. This is my only way to God is through the Son. Amen. Now, I'm moving on. I want to make this point very clearly. No one comes to the Father except through the Son. Jesus said of himself in John 14, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father but by me, by me, by me, by me. The only way that you can come to the Father is by Jesus. Amen. This is why I praise him in the morning, praise him in the noontime, and praise him in the evening, because he is the one that made this whole thing possible. That
possible with men, Jesus has made possible. He has made the impossible possible. You could not come to God. You could not come to, into his presence. But yet in the mercy of God and even in his grace and kindness and loving compassion toward us, he made a way. There was nothing that you could do to restore the relationship. He always wanted this relationship. This is why you were created. You were created by God to be in a relationship with him. That's why he created Adam. It tells us in the Bible that God would come down in the cool of the day. And he came down to fellowship with Adam. That one day he came down and he already knew what was going on. He came down in the cool of the day to fellowship with Adam. And he said, Adam, where are you? And God was not asking this question in order to... to to receive an answer that I'm over here, God. God already knew where he was at, but he wanted Adam to know where Adam was at because sometimes we don't realize how lost we are. We, we don't realize the effect of sin, of how it has emboldened our life and taken a hold of us. It even takes a hold not just of the spirit man, it has taken hold of the entire man. Sin had taken hold of him to where all he saw, was what he lived by was what he saw and what he heard and what he tasted and what he felt. That's what he lived by his senses but God has made a way a perfect way Jesus said if you had known me you would have known my father and from henceforth you know him and you have seen him Philip said show us the father and he said have I been with you so long and you don't know me God was in Christ Reconciling the world unto himself. Amen. Some people say, well, Todd, why do you make such a big deal out of Jesus? I've had people ask me that. Why do you make such a big deal out of Jesus? You ever had anybody ask you that? Why do you make such a big deal out of Jesus? Because nobody comes to the Father except by Him. The calling to fellowship with the Son of God. Now, John just said to us, he said, Truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son. Right? So there is a calling to the fellowship with the Son of God. Look at the scripture with me very clearly here. If you want to look at this in your Bible... God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. You have been called, listen, you have been called not only to a fellowship with the Father, but with his Son. Now some people, they get, they get confused about this and they'll say, well, is this two different people? No, this is not. I'm going to try to explain that, Lord willing, in just a minute. I have been called unto the fellowship with the Father and with His Son. Stay with me. Fellowship of faith with Jesus will grow into love, joy, and glory. Stay with me, please. Hold on to your thoughts and don't let them slip away. Peter says here, You have not seen Him. In whom you have not seen. You have not seen Him. But yet you love him. How in the world am I in love with somebody who I've never seen? We base so much of love on what we see. Oh, you saw that beautiful woman. And you fell in love. You saw that man. Woo! Honey. And you fell in love. Peter says, you have not seen him, and yet you love him, in whom, though you see him not, yet you believe. And look, he says, and you rejoice with a joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. This is preposterous to the natural man. This is preposterous to uh, the man who lives according to the flesh. Because if we live according to the flesh, then we live according to what we see and hear and feel and taste and what we perceive. But we are not living according to that. If you have been called by God to fellowship with him, you have been called unto a fellowship that is by the Spirit. I said by the Spirit. And the Spirit is that which is not temporal, but that which is eternal. And the Spirit is not something that is defined. 
See, I've tried to explain what the Spirit is to people, and the Spirit is not something that is confined. Listen, the Spirit is not confined by anything natural. You are a Spirit. God is a Spirit. Jesus said that God is a Spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in Spirit and in truth. Therefore, if God is a spirit, that means that nothing in this natural world can confine nor define him. You cannot confine nor define God by anything that is here. Now, that doesn't mean that he didn't create it, and it does not mean that we cannot have some sense of understanding because it says the heavens and the earth, they declare the glory of God. Night unto night, day unto day, there's speech that is uttered. The world, all of creation, is, is pointing to him. Even the trees, they lift up their hands to the Lord. I mean, all of creation, the Bible tells us that even the animals and all of creation is groaning for the manifestation of the sons of God. All of creation is waiting on the sons of God to come into their order and to come into their rightful place. The world knows who created it and yet men are still wondering, sitting around saying, I don't know if there's a God. Listen, you can't, you, if you can't look at all of this, if you, it just didn't happen. This did not evolve. That would be the impossibilities of all impossibilities. And if you believe that, then you have got greater faith than, than I could even imagine. I, I've talked to many Darwinists and, and atheists and so on and so forth. And I tell them, you have tremendous faith, but you just simply have faith in the wrong thing. So I'm moving on here. Because he made a promise. Now, no man has seen the Father... And lived. Well, the Bible tells us that we see God through Jesus Christ. Now, if you've got your Bible, I want you to flip open because this I don't have this up here. When I was getting ready this morning, the Lord began talking to me about this a little further. I'm at John chapter 8, if you want to go there with me. John chapter 8, because i got to share this with you just for a few minutes. I'm going to move quickly. And I'm going to move forward. I'm shifting gears here. John chapter 8, verse 42. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, and neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Stay with me for just a minute, because I promised that I would try to explain this. God and who he is, in all of the sense of who he is, God the creator, God the father, God the father, the very heart of God. He is in the sense, I don't want to make this sound impossible, but men cannot look at God and perceive of who he is. Because he is so high, so infinite, so holy, men cannot look at God and even perceive of who he is. The only way that man can perceive or even begin to grasp or understand who God is is through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the revelation of the Father. Hear what I'm telling you. Jesus is the revelation of the Father and he is the glory of God. He is the only way that you can ever look at God and live. He is the only way that you can see God. He... You better hear what I'm telling you. He is the manifestation. Listen, when Jesus was born of a woman and he was born of the Virgin Mary, he came in a form that man could understand so that we could perceive who God is. And listen, as he began to reveal, he revealed the very heart of God. He is the only way that you can look at God. He is the only way that you can see God is through Jesus. This is, isn't God good. He made a way for you to be able to even understand who he is. We think that God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. He's not anything like you or me. He's not like the angels. He's not like anything in creation. He's the creator. He's so far beyond even anything that you can imagine, conceive, or even think of. We think that he's like us, but he's not. He said, my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not. He is so far beyond. That, that, listen, I've been telling you this. The angels, they are in so awe that when they look at him, they can't say anything else but holy. And it means different. Separate. He doesn't look like any. He doesn't look like anything in heaven. God is so holy, so high, so holy, so majestic that the Bible tells us that when He looks on the 
that he humbles himself. He must humble himself to look on the things that are in heaven. Sometimes we think of the splendor of heaven and how wonderful and how majestic it must be. But God sitting in his throne looks at heaven and says, I have to humble myself to look at this. That's how. He is the infinite of infinite. He is the expanse of the universe and beyond. He is the dimension of all dimension, the realm of all. He is, he is far beyond anything that we can even conceive in our mind. I've had people say to me, Todd, how, how can you believe in a God you cannot see? How can you believe in a God? I said, my Lord, if I could fit all of who God was into this three and a half pound brain, then I would be God. Do not think, my dear saints, of God. Do not think, dear saints of God, that you can perceive all of who God is. The only way that you will ever be able to perceive any measure of who God is is through Jesus Christ and how the Spirit of God reveals Him to you. Listen, if, if you're gonna if you're gonna have and I'm gonna talk about fellowship with the Spirit, all right? So don't don't think that I'm not gonna go there. I'm gonna go there because I know what the Spirit is gonna tell me. The Spirit is always pointing me to Jesus. Jesus said that when He comes, He will glorify me. The Spirit of God wants to talk about Jesus. That's who He talks about. He comes to talk about. Yes, He does come to convict the world of sin, righteousness, judgment. But that's because He's pointing them to Jesus. I thank God for the sweet Holy Spirit, and that's who's administration we are currently under Jesus said it is for your advantage that I go away but when I go I will send unto you another comforter and he sent forth the Holy Spirit and I am in the current administration of the Holy Spirit people say well how can you believe in a God you don't see I thank God that I am serving a God that I can't see because he's beyond all that I can see hope imagine think of he's beyond all of this I, I'm not that's why in, in my spirit I'm not moved I'm not moved by what I see hear feel taste touch my Lord. I'm going to read you this verse. I printed this thing off. It was so good. This is from the Amplified, for those of you that like reading the Amplified. And this is not the Amplified classic, but the Amplified. All right, there are two Amplified. This is Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. It says, the Son, the Son, Jesus, is the radiance and the only expression of the glory of our awesome God. Reflecting God's Shekinah glory, the light being, the brilliant light of the divine, and the exact representation and perfect imprint of the Father's essence and upholding and maintaining and propelling all things, the entire physical and spiritual universe by his powerful word, carrying the universe along to its predetermined goal. When he himself and no other had by offering himself on the cross as a sacrifice for sin he accomplished purification from sin and established our freedom from guilt he sat down revealing his complete work at the right hand on the majesty on high revealing his divine authority that's a mouthful that's a long verse of scripture ain't it that's just one verse glory to god I want y'all to memorize that by next week and be able to quote it. Hallelujah. John 14, verse 21. Look at what Jesus said. I love this, but now I'm going to move on to my next point real quick. He that has my commands and keeps them, he it is that loves me. Remember what we, John had said earlier. If we say we have fellowship and walk in darkness, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and we are not doing the truth. Amen. Listen, he says, and he that loves me, shall be loved to my Father, and I will love him, and I will manifest myself to him. The first time I ever read, read that as a believer, I thought, nobody ever told me that. Nobody ever told me that. That God, Jesus said, I will come and I will manifest myself to you. Now you better listen and hear a promise that Jesus has made and something that I can hold in confidence. I expect this. I expect the manifestation of God in my life. I expect in my prayer closet that he's going to manifest himself. And I expect that when I come together with fellow believers that he's going to manifest himself even in a greater way. For me, the day is over. The day I'm declaring a new day unto you. God says, behold, I'm going to do a new thing. I left church for years frustrated because I could go to my prayer closet it and I could go and meet privately with God and God would manifest himself to me but then I'd come to church and I'd leave disappointed. I was like, God, where are you? You're in my closet but you're not at the church. So it turned me to my closet more
more and more. Because that's where I was drawing from. That day is over for the saints of God. A new day is, I declare unto you, a new day has arisen upon the church to where the fellowship with God will be greater in our midst than it will be, it should be. He said, one can put a thousand to fly, two can put, that means there's an exponential that when you come together, Jesus said, if two of you had come together and agreed touching anything, it would be done. So that means that what I'm doing on my own, I can't just do everything on my own. i got to get together with other believers, and I'm believing there's going to be a greater manifestation of God. He said he could pour out his spirit on all of them. He said that the glory of God, it would be, listen, it's going to cover the whole earth. So this leads me to my next point. If I'm in fellowship with God, if I'm in fellowship with Him, I'm in fellowship with the Father and with His Son, I've been in my prayer closet, then I'm expecting God to put me together with other believers who are like-minded. And I must begin to find fellowship with the fellow heirs of the gospel. Now I'm about to get real excited. Glory to God. The Bible tells us, this is for all of us in here, and you need to look at the, the saints that you are surrounded with. Look at them. Look at them real good. Look around the room. You need to look at them. We must walk in light to have fellowship one with another. I want you to say that to one another. We must walk in light in order to have fellowship one with another. Now, he says in 1 John chapter 1, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Listen, I believe that God is so big, so holy, so infinite that as he is revealing his, I need you. I need the saints of God that are in light to be at your optimal. I need you to seek God with all of your heart because I know my God, that my God is going to reveal the greater portion of himself, not just to me. Sometimes we think we've got the whole sum of, of truth and revelation, but I know my God according to his word that he's going to manifest. If he'll manifest himself to me, he'll manifest himself to you. And he's going to give you the light of the gospel and revelation. Of course, I'm going to listen. I'm going to get to know God more even through you than I am on my. Listen, this is why he puts us together. No man is an island unto himself. You can, Listen, he puts you in a body. The arm, I can't say to you that I don't need you because the arm can't say to the foot, I don't need you. I need you. I need you. And you need me. You need me to be at my best and I need you to be at your best. Because there's something greater that he's going to do amongst us than when we are alone. I expect this to happen when I'm alone. For God to develop a love for the brethren. And I believe that this is mandatory. I have been told by so many people, Todd, I don't have to be a Christian and go to church. And my response is always the same. Well, you don't have to. But if you are... You will want to. I made, listen, I, I don't, I'm not going to have all these petty arguments about this. I know people get hurt in church and this happens and that happens and so on and so forth. But I made a declaration in my heart that when I began to follow him, that I was going to follow him. And when I decided to follow him, Jesus just simply said, follow me. He doesn't tell you where you're going, what you're going to experience, what it's going to be like. He doesn't tell you all of that. Some of the things are good. Some of the things seem to be bad. Sometimes I'm sitting there thinking, why are you taking me here and why am I going through this? But you know what? All things are working together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And it doesn't matter what in the world is going on around me. I'm going to keep on serving him. And you ain't going to take me out of the church of God. And, you know, I've, I've been hurt, and I've been hurt, wounded, stabbed in the back, everything else. So what? I'm moving on with him. You know what? The world will hate you, crucify you. But so what? I'm going to keep on moving. You know, sometimes we get we get smitten in the, in the, in the house of God. You know, David said, you know, I would have never thought that this one would do it to me. He said, this is my common friend. This is the one that I walked to the house of God with. My Lord, you might as well go ahead and settle in your heart. Things are going to happen because you're in the midst of an imperfect people at this moment. I had a lady call to church one time and she's giving me all her rundown of what she was looking for in a church. And I just stopped her and I said, you're looking for the perfect church, aren't you? I said, I know where one's at. 
I'm going to get off this phone and leave the door unlocked and you come on up here because when I leave, it's going to be perfect because ain't nobody going to be here in this building. But as soon as you walk in this church, it's going to be imperfect because we are in the midst of a people who are yet growing in the Lord. I don't expect Christian perfection out of you, but I do expect that you are going to walk in a way that is worthy and pleasing unto the Lord. You have to walk that way. If you're going to walk in the light as He is in the light, we can't have fellowship one if you are not walking in the light of God. If you ain't seeking God, we won't have fellowship. Oh, Lord have mercy. So we have to begin to develop a love for the brethren. I believe that that is mandatory. If I'm going to love God, then I have to love the brethren. Now, not everybody in the, oh my, I'm going to get on some touchy subjects now because not everybody in the body of Christ seems to be real likable. Don't, y'all don't, don't sit there all stuffed neck and looking around. I've had a many, I've had Christian people that didn't like me. I've had people that come through here and told me they didn't like me. Yeah, I mean, that's just going to happen. We still, we still, <laughs> we still, uh, brethren in the Lord, but this is a mandatory thing. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 22, he says, Seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. Unfeigned love of the brethren through the Spirit. See that you love one another with a pure heart. How much? Fervently. Yeah. Oh, wow. You know, uh, it, I found out a long time ago, it's real easy to love God. But it's not real easy to love people. And here comes the challenge of it all. God says, if you're going to love me, you're going to have to love them. And you're going to have to love them the way that I love you. What? I thought you was calling me to follow you. Because you, you are easy to, God's easy to love. Because he is so loving. And the, and the reason that we do love him is because he first loved us. Yeah, John tells you that. But then there's these other people thrown in this now. And it's all of us together. Lord have mercy. So we're moving on here. Fellowship is derived from a shared spirit to origin. origin. Excuse me, I couldn't get that out. Look at John chapter 7 and verse 38. He says, he that believes on me, as the scripture says, that out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. I'm trying to tell you something here this morning. If God's going to manifest himself, and he said he would, I believe that the Spirit of God will manifest himself. And he, Jesus has said, up out of your belly, yours, 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 will flow rivers of living water. Listen to me. If, if we are all drinking from the same fountain, which fountain is Christ, then we are all sharing the same waters together. And I believe that those waters that are on the inside of me, as he's talking about his spirit, that out of my spirit, his spirit Listen, out of my spirit, his spirit, that would be a flowing, a flowing of waters, and it is a living water. You have something for me. I have something for you. You have something for each other. I want you to look at each other. You, the church has got to realize that it is in need one of another. You need one another. Look at each other and tell them, I need you. I'm not just preaching a unity message. You need one another. See, so many times we, we don't think that we need one another. Just me and Jesus and my Bible. You need one another. And I don't, just need, I don't need somebody to preach to. I got millions of people out here on the streets to preach to. But I have been called into the house of the Lord and I have been called into a ministry to encourage the brethren and to encourage the saints and to set forth order in God's house concerning this. So, moving forward from here, you have something for each other. This is where I believe that the church, the church is so used to being leashed. We have been leashed by ministers and uh, for so long in the church. I believe that you have a gift and you have a calling. And you have gifts and callings. And those gifts and callings, no matter what they are, not, not everybody in the house is a prophet, not everybody's an apostle, not everybody's a teacher, but some, but he says that he gives according as he wills. And I believe that the Holy Spirit, the same one that gave me a gift, he's got another gift for you. And we may even may have the same gift, but he said there are different administrations of those gifts. So you can have two apostles, but they, they have completely different administrations of it. And I need them. You need apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. You need more input than not. you just getting from me because you only getting a part of the diet you need listen I'm talking about that you need input not just from the spirit of God and through your relationship in the closet but you need input from other
in your life. I need. I hope you just heard what I said. True fellowship in God's house will exhibit oneness. What is oneness? Jesus said, I'm going to have to read this to you real quick. All right, I'm trying to go fast, but I got more than, a, than I can uh, even chew up myself today. All right, neither pray I for these alone, but Jesus said, for those also which will believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, and I are one. He said, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. There is something that has yet, I know there's been oneness movements and so on and so forth, but listen, I'm talking about a oneness of spirit. And oneness of spirit does not mean that we don't have uh, different and individual personalities and are different and we are different and individual people. I am a, you are not me and I'm not you. Glory to God. Thank God. <laughs> Y'all don't want to be me. And I want to be you. I want to be who I am. I want to be who I am through the grace of God. So Jesus said, and he's making a prayer, that they may be one, Father, as you and I are one. Why? Because the world, the world is not going to believe. There is so much division in the body of Christ. Lord have mercy. All right, I'm closing up here. A, fellowship with the Father only comes by Jesus Christ, period. B, fellowship with the Father cannot exclude fellowship with the body of Christ. Yes. Cannot exclude. So my advice to anybody who believes that they can follow God without it including other believers, they are sadly mistaken. Because we have to have fellowship one with another. Now I'll close with these verses of scripture. First John chapter 2 he says, Who is a liar but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. Father and the Son. Literally it reads from Greek, Father, Son. Father, Son. Whosoever denies the Son, the same has not the Father. Now when he says deny, he's talking about who Jesus is as God. I always pull these verses on Jehovah's Witnesses and they, they hate this. He that acknowledges the Son has also the Father. If I acknowledge that Jesus is God, then I have the Father also. He's not Michael the archangel. He's not some uh, plan B of God. He is God. Let that therefore abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. If that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. Continue in the Son and in the Father. I want to encourage you today. I want to encourage you in this fellowship. I didn't come up here to present to you any type of Christian mysticism or to seem as if this was some spiritual lofty information. I have presented unto you the Word of God. And I have presented to you from the Word of God that God has called you into a fellowship and you cannot have fellowship with God while still walking in darkness. You must, you must repent. You must repent of a former lifestyle. You cannot continue therein. And you must not only repent, but you must live a life of faith. And that faith is in his son. Now, as I have faith in the Son of God, God has called me into a fellowship of people who are like-minded and who are not walking in darkness but are following the same Jesus. I said the same Jesus. There's a whole lot of different Jesuses out there. I'm talking about the Jesus that is in this Bible. I'm talking about the Jesus that is sitting at the right hand of God the Father. I'm talking about the Jesus that is the Son of God 
Son of Man, and that he is God, Lord, King of Kings, that God, that Jesus, that same Jesus that said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and you cannot come to the Father but by me. He knows who he is, and I want to know who he is. I want to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to know him. People can think that I'm nuts, crazy, whatever. I don't care. I just want to know Jesus. I just want to see Jesus. This is my life. This is all that I have, and it is all that you have. It is all that is in the world. This is all that you have in this world. You can have the abundance of everything in this life but yet lose your own soul. You don't have anything else or anywhere else you can go. So next week I'll be covering, glory to God, I'm going to be covering the fellowship of the Spirit and the promise. Then I'll be covering prayer and fasting because I am talking about fellowshipping with God. And These are ways in which we fellowship with God. These are fields that we have to grow in. We must grow in sanctification and holiness. We must grow in the word of God because it is the grafted word of God which is able to save your soul. And we also must uh, have fellowship with him according to his glory and sufferings. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll finish up that over the next couple of weeks, Lord willing. We're going to get ready to take communion here this morning or what is called a Eucharist. Or the Lord's Supper. Eucharist simply means the thanksgiving. I seem to prefer that more now than just communion. Because this is a communion of saints. But this is also a thanksgiving. This is the Lord's Supper. That he called us unto a table. I'll remind you of what Jesus said in Revelation 3 and verse 20. He spoke to the church at Laodicea and he said, You have become lukewarm. But he said... Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man will hear my voice and come and open the door, he said, I will come in unto you and I will sup with you and you with me. This means that we can have fellowship with God and he is so willing to restore that. I pray that your heart hears his tender mercies and his love towards you. God wants to make himself known to you. And he wants a relationship with you. If there's been things that's been standing in the way, if there's been obstacles, we're just going to begin to turn our heart to prayer.